Thank you for tuning into White Centipede Noise Podcast. Please hit the like button and subscribe to this channel. This podcast is made possible by viewer and listener support. If you enjoy this podcast, please consider supporting it at patreon.com slash white centipede noise. White Centipede Noise is a label and mail order based in Germany, releasing top quality noise on tape, CD, and vinyl. White Centipede Noise is also the premier EU-based distributor of international noise. Visit whitecentipedenoise.com to see available label releases and weekly distro updates. Welcome to White Centipede Noise Podcast. My name is Oscar Brummel. Today my guest is a fresh face in Harsh Noise from Finland, doing the projects Apropot and in the group The New Boyfriends. Please welcome Vilho Koivisto. Hi, Hi. Vilho. And thanks for the invite. Of course, of course. Thank you for being with me. Um, so... Um, Right off the bat, I, I, you know, referenced you as a f- fresh face in noise. And, you know, I don't know how true that is. I, I know that in some sense, um, you have been quite sudden in the past several years, since I think 2008 or, or 2018 or so, um, yeah. doing op- opera pot, as far as I know. Um, but um you know you're not as young as i thought you were i guess i thought you were like uh you know 19 years old and just figuring this out but you know you told me oh you have kids coming home soon so you're yeah. you're not you're not you've you've been you've been around for a while can you please tell me about your um your history um in terms of discovering noise music maybe your history before that with music and um and what 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 your personal history is with with music and noise etc okay uh Okay, where to start? Uh, yeah, Aprobat, I started doing, yeah, 2018, 19. But uh, with music, I've always been connected to music. I listen to lots of music and uh, from the kid uh, and, and, mm-hmm. and, and explored new, new sounds every time. And in, in noise, uh, I think it was 2000 five, six or something, uh, mm-hmm. I started to recognize that there is such thing as noise. noise, mm-hmm. And uh, I was listening uh, mostly free, free jazz stuff back mm-hmm. then uh, and all, 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 all kind of music. But I think the Merch Bow was one of the first noise artists I like it usually. I think it's, sure. it came true. Uh, I listened to lots of Boris, the Japanese mm-hmm. band, and there's collaborations with Merced Boy, so I tried tried that out. Mm-hmm. So, but it was more curiosity than I just started to listen. It's lurked in the background many years, and maybe in 2010, somewhere like that, I started to more buying noise records and stuff. Uh, a time in fin- Finland, there was Umbia and Grant mostly. I was familiar and I didn't know uh, not lots what what other noise there is uh, other than Japanese stuff. Mm-hmm. So f- from that on, um, I started listening more and more noise every year. And I, I had also my urge to make noise myself or do different sounds. I had some, mm-hmm. some bands before and uh, like shuffled around with uh, some instruments uh, or not instruments, played a guitar really poorly mm-hmm. before, okay. but I never, never really liked to play, play it. And I was uh, more interested at the other, other sounds, sounds. And okay. I had some recordings done at that time, 10 years ago, but, and then it, uh, 
got a bit slow, slow with things and doing, doing music and stuff. But I think five, six years ago, I wanted to start again to make some noise or music, music uh, that is to figure it out. Uh, there is, there was many years that I tried to figure out uh, what to do or how to do, or have a right room to do it. To mm-hmm. do it. And, uh, I think it's 1819 when I, I was more into noise and it, it's got bigger portions every year to noise listening about yeah. other music listening. And, and today it's almost 80% of noise. Maybe, yeah. I think. This episode of White Centipede Noise Podcast is brought to you by Flag Day Recordings. Established in 2017, Flag Day Recordings is a tape and CD label based out of Pennsylvania, focused on promoting harsh noise, avant-garde, musique concrète, electroacoustic, and ambient styles. Recent CDs include Mariam Sirvan, Peter J. Woods, and Tourette. Flagdayrecordings.bigcartel.com so you were experimenting with sound already several years before yeah, releasing yeah, music yeah. as an applicant. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. That's, yeah something that, you know, that's one thing that strikes me about, about your earlier tapes is that they sound, you know, they sound like you already know what you're doing in some ways. Like, yeah. you know, and the packaging also, the, the presentation, you know, it doesn't seem like you just kind of are learning as you go. I mean, I think there's been improvement but at the yeah. same time, your early stuff was already like, you know, you could tell that you have been working on this and thinking about it. And yeah. um, what do you think that's important for newer artists to, 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 to do that and to work on things and refine things before they start releasing music? Uh, yeah, before releasing, definitely. But most important, or important thing is uh, experimenting stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, for me, it's also... Uh, all the time it's experimenting i'm doing trying new things all the time and i don't know exactly what i'm doing but just yeah. pick out the best 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 stuff to for release and yeah before uh, i regard the stuff i knew how to start doing things but how did you develop your techniques and how did you learn about techniques because you know it's it's there are, I don't know what you're using, and I do hear a lot of experimentation, but at the same time, you, in harsh noise, you kind of, a lot of this sort of analog hmm. style harsh noise, you have these same kind of elements used in different ways. You have distortion, you have some tape sounds, you have some, you know, metal sounds, um, but but everyone uses them a bit differently. How did you kind of discover that these are some of the basic elements to use? Yeah, uh, before I started properly making noise uh, a couple of years ago, I was in the flea market and I saw a f- mint conditioned four tracker tape player. Hmm. I thought uh, now it's now or never is the right time to start doing doing oh, it. So yeah. I, everything is around a four tracker okay. analog recorder for me and. I started, uh, probably I first record, uh, played played with it and junk metal and that, that kind of stuff uh, maybe half a year before I started to release anything. Mm-hmm. I just learned, learned things and figuring out what sounds good, good. And I have many tapes that I have recorded stuff. Fill them with sounds, sounds and slowly developed from there. There. Yeah, and for t- uh, everything, uh, I don't use pedals at all or any distortions. It's all everything mm. is about tape decks, mm-hmm. uh, mostly different mics mm-hmm. and recordings. So mm-hmm. your 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 thick distortion, textural distortion is all coming from like overdriven, overdriven, tape, yeah, tapes, overdriven yeah. tape preamps and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But how did you how did you how did you learn that this is something you can even do because was it going to shows was it hearing people talk about noise because even to know okay, scrap metal contact yeah. mics. This is something that, you know, I think you kind of somehow 
see someone doing it or, or hear about someone doing it? Were there, were you, were you going to live shows? Were you, were you active on message boards and things like that? Yeah, not active on message boards, but definitely read, read this, read, read them. And there's much noise scenes I read and there's much information too. You can find anywhere else. And, mm-hmm. and uh, there's not many live shows in, in all, all here, but talk with friends and learn about it. So of course, the most important thing is listening. I don't know. Yeah. Figuring yeah. out what it could be, how, how it could be done. Right. And you live in Aul. Um, is that a fairly large city? Uh, fairly large in Finnish perspective. Okay. Fourth or fifth biggest, but yeah. So but you're, I, you're, in, you're, you're in a, you're in a metropolitan area. You aren't in a rural a rural area rural, more rural side yeah you are in a rural area more rural uh, i don't know uh, rural but there's no neighbors a uh, couple hundred of meters okay but yeah do you f- think your connection to other finnish uh noisemakers or the finnish scene in general has been a an important part of of, of learning what you want to do and learning about more stuff and, and connecting with people? Yeah, definitely. Definitely there is. How does that work in, in being kind of more um, separated or remote? Because, you know, there's there's local spaces where everyone is coming together and that kind of forms a scene, like, you know, maybe in a big city. But then mm-hmm. there's also Finland is seemingly very rural, spread apart. Mm-hmm. And you still don't have, you still have a very big Finnish noise scene that seems to be kind of unified, but a lot of those people maybe aren't even seeing each other in person. You know what I mean? They're still maybe only, they may be very far apart and never meeting up, but yeah. still a scene, a scene kind of forms and an identity. How, why do you think that happens in a, in a country like Finland? What, what are the things that kind of, um, connect people? Uh, yeah, I think noise, noise and interest in noise connects people. And of course, nowadays it's easier to communicate and, and it's such a small scene. So I think almost everybody knows everyone somehow. Mm-hmm. And, and if, if you are into noise, you mostly usually you try to find out everything about it. So if, I don't know, right. but in Finland, um, even we are more apart, but we are used to it. There's not, uh, but yeah. maybe it's in some Helsinki area. It might be different, but I, I don't know. No, I haven't been, been, uh, on the uh, noise geeks on Helsinki before. And okay. because it's, six, 700 kilometers, kilometers from here. Yeah. Tell me, tell me about the Finnish noise scene as you see it, because, you know, is it, is it something very, uh, unified together? Is it separated? Are there different groupings, um, or it's, connections to each other? It's definitely separated. Everybody is doing their own, their own, own stuff. <laughs> Most, mm-hmm. I think. What is it that kind of defines Finnish noise for you? Yeah, you can recognize Finnish noise. Maybe if you hear it, there is this certain sound. Of course, it's a big use of scrap metal is one one thing. Mm-hmm. One thing, mm-hmm. of course, but there's and it depends on the time. I think it was different stuff ten years ago than it was now, mm-hmm. and there's more broader spread, spectrum. It's getting more broader today. Finish yeah. Noise, of course. Yeah. So with with Upper Pot, you have um, a fairly playful aesthetic, I would say. I don't know if that's the right word, but yep. your releases have a certain, yeah, playful sound to them, um, active, kind of high energy, but not not spastic, but kind of high energy. Um, interesting contrasts, interesting sound sources mixed in there. It's still fairly, um, fairly minimal. It's not like, um, 
overloaded with things going on, but there are like you know nice contrasting elements that have a different uh, atmosphere than some dark, um, gnarly, evil, whatever kind of stuff. Yeah. And your your visuals are also somewhat you know playful, humorous, a bit more modern, I would say, than than some some other tra more tra traditional uh, stuff that we've seen. Um, what are what are some of the things that that inspire Opera Pot as a project or, or themes you are interested in or or work with? Yeah, uh, usually I'm not so interested in the noise uh, in in those darker, grimmer themes that are mm -hmm. usually presented. For me, noise is something something different. It's about mm -hmm. it's about the sound and the beauty of the sound. It's it's mm -hmm. it's more like I like to represent. Uh, the possibilities of the sound and uh, and uh, uh, like uh, for for teams, for example, example uh, the certain teams in noise like what what when I'm doing doing stuff, I get inspiration uh, mostly. I think of chaos. And beauty mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. mix between how, how to put mm -hmm. it simply, <laughs> simply but yeah, it's it can it it presents more it's more joyous thing noise for me than than uh, venting something out for frustration or aggression. It's mm -hmm. more more celebrating. Sure. Yeah. Cool. Um, why do you think most people associate noise with pain or or darkness? Do you, I mean, do you think that's kind of limited? Yeah, I think definitely everyone everyone approaches noise as their fit, but maybe it's because it's accuracy sound, and the first thing you associate it with it's it has to be accuracy imaginary or themes or something like mm -hmm. that. But accuracy sound and textures. It's much more than just that on the surface, because yes. it definitely penetrates you further. And there's been talk about soothing textures of harsh noise or right. some, or, 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 or that. It's definitely true in a sense. But if you go beyond beyond the accuracy of sound, there's much more to it. I think. Yeah. Do you think, um, you know, you work with mostly harsh sound and aggressive sound. Do you think yeah. you will explore other less abrasive elements of noise? Or do you think, do you think harsh, harsh sound is your, is your main thing that you're interested in exploring? Yeah, definitely. I'm working out other stuff, mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, or, or less, less harsh approach. I think I've got some something, but I don't know. Maybe I, I yeah, definitely. I, I've got some recordings that are not so harsh, but I haven't utilized them properly to be maybe in a, some smaller sections of things. But there yeah. is, it's, it's not all about the harsh. It's, it, it depends what I like to do, not mm -hmm. limiting myself too much. It could be anything. When was it that you first discovered that noise can be such a a beautiful and and you know introspective thing? I think first I heard noise; it was unbearable, definitely. But you learn to listen it. I uh, for loud sounds. I I think I remember I was going to movies. Uh, I think 10 or 11 years old, this my first big movie, I think it was Apollo 13 or something mm -hmm. in a movie mm -hmm. theater. I haven't seen it since, but and uh, there was this space space uh, sequence that it, the sound was incredibly loud for my ears. I haven't any, any I have been in 
before in the movies, but children movie, movies and got yeah, that, yeah. that stuff. And I associated that it was horri- horrifying, but really exciting at the same same time to be in space, claustrophobic, and this big space, chunky metal, chunky sound. Of, I don't in, in, remember it exactly, but yeah. I remember the feeling. And that's why I associate loud sounds maybe for noise to uh, a noise of space. Space. Okay. Uh, so uh, there's also themes of space in my work usually. Yes. But this starts piling up from there. And uh, I think that that might be the one thing that uh, made me curious, curious about uh, loud sounds and of course there's this chaos thing when you can't control something and let it just flow or you can control it but it doesn't sound like that it's really powerful more than yes. just uh, if you if you know what's coming next it's not interesting but sure. for, for just going with the flow and let yourself to the river Yes, uh, cool. or loud noise or something like that. Yes, I don't no, know how absolutely. to put it more. No, it's. I think that's very. You put it very well. Yeah, but uh, definitely when the approach. Maybe I think jazz listening might be something to do with finding the beauty in noise too, because free mm-hmm. jazz and everything. It's the sound palette. Some might sound harsh, but there's also those feelings and textures you cannot cannot present with any other instrument than saxophone, for example, or wall right. of sound, sound, and it, maybe it comes from there too. Maybe listening, mm-hmm. just listening, finding yeah. comfort. Yeah, cool. Um, you use jazz also pretty heavily on a recent new Boyfriends tape, so I want to talk about that in a little bit, but... Yep. Kind of sticking to sticking to the the track. Um. Um. You know, Opera Pot started shortly before the pandemic started closing everything down, and I don't know exactly how it was in Finland, but um, you know, for most of the world, there haven't been many live gigs in the past couple of years. Have you played live with Opera Pot before? I haven't played live before, and I'm not sure if I'm going to because my approach it's is a bit different for things. It's mm-hmm. more uh, constructing the sound. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I have to. I've, I've thought thought that I should figure out a live set to do, but I don't know if it would be interesting. But of course, I can get it interesting but it's a different approach then. yeah I, not... I, I was curious because i hear that in your sound that it's that it's uh you said you use a four track heavily and i hear that your sound is very much like uh it sounds like a almost music concrete like it sounds like it's constructed within the tapes different yeah. sounds kind of being layered on top of each other but not played live yeah um what is your what is your uh technique or approach when when constructing apropat music i record a lot sounds Mostly, it's every uh, leans heavily on recording uh, scrap metal sounds. Mm-hmm. I use various. I, I record it with a couple of mics at the same time, the four triggers mm-hmm. or or some or some other other tape players, handheld ones, mm-hmm. micro cassettes, everything, mm-hmm. and sometimes also uh, reel to reel and uh, even phone if nothing else is available. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then I record the, on the tape and I mangle the sound or try try, try it through as another dex with feedback loop to get it sound right. Right. Of course, I play, it's, I don't like to play, play music or noise, but of course there's playing involved with the uh, four tracking and twisting some right. knobs, but I'm not interested on doing the playing, playing the noise, like, like okay. to say. 
I like okay. to. I'm more interested in, in the recording and mangling the sound. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. and yeah, yeah. I, I understand. Yeah. Um, to make something new, new. It's like in, uh, yeah, yeah. College is collage. Yeah, I, I I get that because I think there's some in some ways there's some sort of pressure or expectation that noise needs to be played live yeah. and needs to be able to play live. But I think at the same time that's that's sort of limiting in the sense that there's only certain kinds of things you can do live, yeah. which can work live, you know, physically, yeah. and within the recording, there's so many more possibilities. Yeah. And I think the expectation that someone should be doing something that can uh, then be performed live can maybe re- limit their their creativity in creating sound uh, for re- recordings, you know? And yeah. and, and I, I feel the same way. I, I, I value live noise, but I, but I don't necessarily think that's the that should be the the goal because you know live you might have to have some you know mixer some pedals some microphones etc cetera, etc cetera. whereas in a in a in a studio setting you can be using everything under the sun and combining it in all sorts of different ways um do you, do you use computers do you use uh, DAWs for uh, yeah yeah i started using using i think one year ago i first yeah. tapes i made made with only with four tracker but lately i started yeah. learn to use daw so it's it's got much yeah. more easier <laughs> that's that way yeah uh, i think i think it traps too but it's it's more much more faster and easier yeah it, yeah i think daws are, are great tools for editing i mean i don't yeah. necessarily think I don't like a lot of uh, computer sounds, I guess, but that's no. a taste thing. But I think for editing, there's so much possibility there, and I don't, I don't know why they get shunned. People, people, people like to avoid them, but I think sometimes it's just because people don't really know how to use them. Yeah, yeah. And, for, for editing, show sure, it's, 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 it, it's. If you do it or mixing, or mastering. Yeah, it's exactly. Definitely, yeah. but, but like that. Which, so- which software do you use, just out of curiosity? Well. Which software do you use? Uh, Reaper. Yeah. Okay. I've yeah. never used Reaper, but I've heard it's that's the free one, right? Uh. Yeah. 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 yeah it's really I've heard good. it's. I've heard it's really good. Yeah. 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 Um, it's fairly, fairly easy, easy, mm-hmm. easy to use. But I haven't, couldn't try to use it. I learned to use myself. We were mastering this chance of entropy tape with Dustum. But the Dustum he. He showed me how to use it. So from that on, cool. I've used it also. It's it's helped, helped a lot for mixing, mixing process. This episode of White Centipede Noise Podcast is brought to you by Ominous Recordings, based in Sweden, a harsh noise peddling underdog label since 2005. Available on CD is the complete discography of Knives, a 2005 harsh noise collab between the Cherry Point and Pedestrian Deposits' John Borges. The threesome slitting 7-inch with the 2020 New York City gig. Also, a reissue of one of the best Harsh Noise albums ever, Black Leather Jesus, Anti, as well as Golden Serenades, Fit, and three of the reader reissues, co-released with Phage Tapes, tapes by Foul, Schizophrenic Genius, and Split Tape between JSH and Compre Pretor. Visit www.ominousrecordings.com to get your fix. So you recently did um, a CD for my label, White Centipede Noise. Yep. Um... And before that, you had a number of tapes released under your own label, Satatuata, is that correct to say it? Satatuata, yeah. And um, maybe some self release stuff. You had a, a, a couple others releasing tapes of yours, also Narcolepsia. Yeah. Um, but was there a difference for you between recording for a tape and recording for what you knew would be a, a CD, did did you ha- did you take a different approach at all? Uh, uh, not, uh, not no, not not. Of course, there su- might be something unconscious, conscious approaches, but I didn't know I was doing a CD when I was doing this 
CD for you, but right. after, afterwards, I thought that maybe this would be better on CD. Right. There is two tracks, in fact, on that CD, but the first one is split in nine parts. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so you were originally were maybe thinking it would be a tape because we, yeah, we talked yeah. about it originally and we didn't know if it would be a tape or CD. That's yeah. true. Yeah. But I think in the middle of the process or something, I figured out well, maybe it should be CD. Yeah. There is thing, uh, if you do, uh, are doing CD or tape, uh, I think you are thinking more about it, how to, yeah. how to approach it. And it should be maybe more, more told about release if you're doing a CD, maybe. I think. Sure. Uh, but that shouldn't be like that at all. Every release should be, should be like it, uh, de depending on the format. But maybe it's the yeah. tape is easier to manufacture. So, but it doesn't. Uh, maybe CD might even limit you so a little if you want yeah. to it safe. I don't know. How is that? Why, why do you think that? Uh, you want to make something that, uh, if you know it's going to be a bigger pressing or something, it, you want to make it to sound. Uh, that you don't want to take risks with that. I think if you make a hmm. tape with fifteen or hundred, I think you can be more open with risks. I don't know. Maybe interesting. Yeah. Maybe yeah. I think it still is more like a more like a real format of music, and it because sure. yeah, yeah. It's I see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah, I don't know how to put it. Yeah. Do you think um, having having a CD release? You've also had your you've also had some of your earlier tapes released as a collection by Freak Animal. Yeah. On on double CD, right? Double CD, yeah. Um, has that, have, have those releases changed uh, the project or how people receive it or people's no, exposure good. to it? Has, yeah, it has, an effect, has it has an effect on your project? Uh, I don't think it hasn't affected, but it it's really good. It's got more uh, recognition from the CDs that is more widely available, both ones. Mm -hmm. Free animals, double CD. It's the, every all the tapes besides uh, that I myself released and start to have the releases and one bonus track. Mm -hmm. It was laid out as is. It wasn't mastered mastered or anything. It's it's the same sound as in tape should be, should mm -hmm. be. And yeah, uh, uh, when it's more widely available. Available from Freak Animal and from you, it's definitely it affects. Uh, I don't know if it affects the approach of the project, but sure. But yeah, how how does it feel to suddenly have so many people interested in in your project? Because I think that uh, you know, I would say Upper Pot very is very much right now a, a, a quite talked about and uh you know people have a lot of interest in in this product kind of suddenly and are realizing how how great it is how does that how does that feel to you yeah it's really flattering yeah it's really hard to hard to uh, and it's hard to think but um yeah it's really flattering i'm really thankful <laughs> thankful for the support it's it's getting getting but yeah it's strange <laughs> <laughs> what what are your thoughts on the current uh, moment in international noise scene? Because you're 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 kind of starting out your project at a time where there's a lot of really great activity, and in, in some ways you're a big part of that activity because you're also you know you're doing a lot of great noise yourself, and you're also doing this label which is quite prolific. You know you've you've been putting out a lot, especially your last batch was I think nine releases. Seven. You know. Yeah, seven. seven. Okay. Yeah. Seven, but that's, you know, that's a lot. And you keep, yeah. seems like you have a new batch of tapes out every month. Yeah. Um, yeah. What do you, what do you think about the, the current moment? I guess if you weren't involved as an artist for so long that it's maybe hard to have perspective, but, but do you see this something that, does this feel normal to you? Do you think it'll something that'll keep growing? I think 
it will keep keep growing at maybe for a time i think it, it's bit, mm-hmm. it, it's the interesting noise has been getting bigger bigger in a few years it might be that i myself have been involved it might be uh that i feel about it that because but but i think there's more people doing noise or but there's more projects and more releases coming i think mm-hmm. but but mostly mostly because i'm interested for myself on that of that scene scene so yeah. do you see yourself maybe getting uh burnt out at some point or 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 or, or moving on to something else uh no definitely noise is for the rest of my life i think <laughs> 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 what about what about other people because yeah. what about other people because we've seen you know we've seen kind of waves of of interest and right now there's a high wave yeah. do you think do you think there are certain things that are going to keep it pushing pushing it forward do you think do you think there's going to ever be a o- oversaturation yeah definitely oversaturation kind of yeah. yeah yeah of course it goes with waves but uh i i think the interest will keep i hope it will keep in the high points points mm-hmm. and if there's things go in waves and in cycles yeah. definitely. but yeah if, uh, if there's some some project that pushes through anyways maybe some it's the audience might get smaller but it's always there do you think there are limits to noise do you think there are limits to harsh noise like how far it can go in terms of sound or how many people can be interested in this sound either the sound evolving into something more than what it already is or or that this sound which already is established and is in some ways quite traditional i mean in some ways harsh noise isn't really so experimental music it's like a fairly limited defined tradition yeah. do you think there's a limit to how many people can can be involved and interested i don't think there's limits for things it depends on of the people uh, the interest because of course harsh noise harsh noise is traditional as you said but if the sound and or the approach it's is getting like uh, how to put it But there's so much possibilities in harsh noise other than mm-hmm. just it being a sound but of course never it, I, i'm sure it's never might never get bigger audiences audiences but if you try to mix harsh noise with some normal music and there is but i don't know if it's if it's just harsh noise it's just an element of another music it's mm-hmm. not maybe harsh noise thing or something like that but yeah of course there should be not really hard to put in the words first but there should be no, there are possibilities in noise and they should be utilized definitely yes yeah but to, for to sure. make it easier for people to come come into noise scene see yeah. yeah maybe even products like yours are are, are good for that in bringing more people into the fold because i think a lot of people are maybe turned off or at least have a certain preconception due to the aesthetics or 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 the 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 stereotypes of noise and i think in some ways i think sometimes why can't why aren't more people interested in harsh noise because the sound actually is very pleasant and fun and it's a lot i mean it's not for everyone of course but it's there's a lot of there's a lot of interesting things about it for anyone that likes sound. And I think, and I think a lot of more people could be interested in it. Yeah. Um, but I think, I think the, yeah, the, the aesthetics or, or the associated yeah, things are a- somewhat, sometimes what people, people kind of, it keeps people out. Yeah. Um, Definitely. that's the one thing that pushes people yeah. off. Yeah. Aesthetics. I'm Which, not, you know, I don't, I'm not, I don't think people, yeah. I don't, I don't think every noise product should change from, you know, going away from, grim or dark content yeah. or, or aesthetics but i think i think it's great to, to have other sorts of 
simply other sorts of approaches. I think even for people within harsh noise, it's 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 yeah. it's it's, it's um, it expands the the landscape yeah. and ex expands the the enjoyment of it. Yeah, for me personally, you know, I think I love to see more wider approaches and more yeah. wider thought and 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 feeling around it. I think that's that's great, and I think that also has yeah has that possibility to bring more people in and get more people interested and get their ear yeah. to start. Yeah, definitely. And even it's abstract, general, there is, it's it's so personal. Every everyone have their own ap approach to it. So people, yeah. yeah it, 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 it although it's it, it's a gen general, but it it doesn't limit you as much as other genres does. For example, yeah, yeah. right. This episode of White Centipede Noise Podcast is brought to you by Scream and Ride Distro and Absurd Expedition Label, Canadian-based source for experimental electronics, harsh noise, etc. Over 1,500 items in stock on all formats. Media mail shipping to the USA and affordable international shipping. Coming early 2022. Hermit Chick White Split Tape. Two distinct vocal noises approaches from opposite coasts of Canada. Neural Objective Constraint Tape. Unreleased material from 1996. Mott and Violent Shogun, Mangle Tape, Split and Collaborative Tape Works, Andrew Nolan and Misery Engine, Split Tape, Cosmic Industrial Dusty Noise Malaise, The Rita, Herschel the Shoot Tape, Sputtering Crunch of Obsessive Minimalism, Alex York Double Tape, Tape and Synth Works for Melancholy Mood. Visit ScreamandRide.com and AbsurdExposition.Bandcamp.com. Tell me about the new boyfriends. Yeah. Uh, we start a project with Veiko from Moga. Moga was, I think it was 2018 he started the project. We've been friends mm -hmm. for a long time. He used to live in Oulu, Oulu and uh, the, uh, nowadays he lives in Turku. It's 500, 600 kilometers apart from here. Mm -hmm. So we, we have talked about that we should start a project to make, make harsh noise. I started making myself uh, early recordings of opera, but I maybe played played those to Wake Wake a couple of friends, friends, and uh, we uh, we the approach is that I handled the metal chunk and Wake does the pedal noise, and really didn't know what to do. But one time Wake came visit my house and. We set set up the uh, my garage and recorded the first tape over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that has that seems to have a more played approach than yeah. Opera Pot. Yeah. Opera Pot is like very inside a tape deck. It sounds mm -hmm. like where this sounds yeah. like it's really inside of a room. Yeah, yeah, it's it's live recordings in a room. Room, uh, the first two tapes. Yeah, definitely, and. Uh, it's recorded on a four tracker with three or four mics. Before we start uh, recording, there's usually sauna involved, a little few drinks, and and <laughs> we'll be go to the garage and set up the space and do a sound check. And then every time before before the track, uh, before the uh, we've discussed how we started and we go from there. There mm -hmm. and they are all not rehearsed live recordings. Just they're not rehearsed. No, no, no. no. They're all, only a couple of minutes of talking how we started and we go from there. Yeah, hope it's cool. When the tape stops or we turn things down. Yeah, yeah. Because they all have a very different approach. So it sounds like you guys are really trying for different. Yep ways or combinations to uh, to combine these elements or to play these elements is you know yeah, yeah like the, the, the the cd on, on on white centipede noise is i forget how many tracks but i think six or seven and each one has a very yeah different com combination of sounds and, and and ways to play them i mean one even goes so far as to being like rhythmic you have boom yeah. boom boom yeah. tsh, tsh, and it's like a song, and then the the, yeah. the grinding noise comes on top of it, and it's it's yeah. like a, a tribal rhythmic song that yeah. you know 
slowly devolves into more noise chaos, but it holds this structure. Yeah, it turned out really good. That city, it's it was it's more focused than other ones, but in every tracks, always every release or every track stage, always every time there's something uh, slightly different approach of things. And mm-hmm. so in this, we recorded that CD, CD uh, in a barn at Veikko's cabin, cabin on Pudasjärvi. Cool. And it's a couple hundred kilometers from here. He and uh, set the four tracker over there and hand, handled, uh, Put the mics, the roof, and mm-hmm. other other spaces, and uh, yeah, the approach is different on every track. And the uh, rhythmic track, uh, Wake is a drummer, so he has this rhythm. Mm. He knows uh, it was he banging on a old abandoned uh, electric sauna. Uh, what is called? heater? Heater, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Awesome. Yeah, and there was lots of, and you utilized the stuff we found from there. Another couple of takes were the chunks we ran from my yard. What about the the number three tape? Because there's some serious saxophone on there. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, there's a different approach on the on it. It was recorded, recorded in two parts. The first mm-hmm. part, uh, there's this third member, Masa, who handles the saxophone. It was recorded, they recorded uh, his pedal, pedals and uh, the saxophone at the same time. It was live recording and then they sent it to me and I added the chunk and mixed it together. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, like recorded in different we haven't recorded that live. Only the pedal noise and saxophone are live, and everything is added on after. Okay, There's... it's a really interesting approach for a tape because we've heard, yeah. you know, the noise world has heard noise with saxophone before, but this is really yeah. different in some way. It's yeah. it's really played almost like jazz music. It's yeah. very also deep in a lot of ways. It's not like this this yeah. wild. Um, wild instrument that sounds like another feedback or something like that it's yeah. like it provides this fat bass and the it's it's a it's a great it's a great approach i think yeah yeah and it was natural because for the new boyfriends other release the, the approach is always jazzy approach to play mm-hmm. it's always like this free jazz approach to things to play out and improvise mm-hmm. and try to get the sound of everything yeah so you, your approach when you play together as new boyfriends is is close to free jazz you close say to free jazz. i think yeah yeah I, I wish we are thinking about it and there's yeah. celebrated cele- yeah yeah it's something yeah cool. it's more like celebration to smash things mm-hmm. and yeah and yeah nice. it's, it's it's more like yeah, improvising and listening to each other and playing. And when it goes off, of course, you can, at that, down, that time, you can, uh, you just, yeah. Sweet. Um, you mentioned that you have kids coming home soon. Yep. So you're, you're a dad and um, how, how do you, Explain noise to your kids. Do they know about what you do? Do they do they see you do it? Do they hear it? Yeah, they know it. Yeah, they know noise. It's strange to me. If I would have no, known noise, say eight year old or earlier, it would be. I don't know how to approach it, but yeah, they know what noise is. <laughs> do they do they respond to it? Are they are they dr- interested in it or drawn to it, or is it something that they don't? Yeah. I don't know, like, maybe not, not, not yet so much interesting, but they recognize it. If they listen, some, that I heard some strange sounds, they would always say it sounds like daddy's music or something like that. <laughs> they know it, don't know it. And of course they fooled around sometimes played. 
Mm-hmm. They played stuff, scratch, scratch some pots or plates. Yeah. I wonder how that works in terms of them potentially being interested because, you know, it's it, you usually kind of rebel from what your parents yeah. bring you up on. Yep. You know, I I had fairly strict parents in terms of like letting me listen to you know inappropriate music when I was young. They were very they were very on top of like censoring yep. that I didn't listen to music with, you know, extreme language or 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 content and things like that yep. when I was young, but then of then of course somehow by accident I'm an adult now and 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 I'm obsessed with noise, which is maybe worse than anything they were trying to prevent me from at that time. So I'm wondering if maybe you bring your children up on something sonically extreme, or maybe if they'll if they'll if they'll follow it and find an interest in it and grow into yeah. it, or if they'll just fall back and be like, you know, end yeah. up loving, you know, just straight yeah. up pop music or something like that. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Oh, yeah, we and we listen lots of lots of music in the house. I love good pop music. music sure. I mean, every every kind of music of the time. It's not only just noise, but right. I don't know. Yeah, it might be turn off. The noise might be turn off to them. Like uh, the slugger was turned off to me when I was a kid, but yeah, I can mm-hmm. now listen to whom and Schlager. <laughs> Schlager <laughs> is uh, we have that in Germany too, but for those yeah. who, people who don't know, Schlager is like yeah. um, how would you de- de- define Schlager? Finnish Schlager, uh, Finnish Schlager, it's traditional, uh, I don't know, it's not dance music, but uh, I don't know how to. Uh, describe it in. Uh, uh, I think people know Schlager. I think Americans don't know Schlager. I don't know. I don't know. For for Americans, it might be some depressing country. The most. <laughs> it's like very pro. It's like very mainstream proletariat. Yeah. Traditional pop music, right? Yeah, for yeah. in the in the in the native tongue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like for like for like bars or for, for, for yeah. sporting events kind of things. Yeah. Yeah. But there, there's good stuff <laughs> even in there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. But yeah, but I hope they learn to approach music more widely than other just radio to radio. Uh, but it's not about the radio anymore for the kids. It's about the tumorang and TikTok and what what is there? There's those small snippets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, of, that's, that's that was my question. I was going to ask that: is are they are they in that whole world of TikTok and and all the yeah, internet stuff that's I, going I on? I haven't let them to TikTok yet, yet but there's this thirty seconds. Uh, they, you, you, kids usually listen only, only choruses or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But lots of that. They're right. interested in music. Yeah, that way. Do you consciously try to introduce them to other things? Uh, they, to ex- they get introduced because we listen music all the time in the house, I think. Mm-hmm. But maybe not that time yet. Maybe if they be, grow a bit older. Yeah, I sure. Guess. How old yeah. are they? Eight. Okay, eight years old. This episode of White Centipede Noise Podcast is brought to you by Cruel Symphonies, Intrepid Noise from Syracuse, New York. Recent releases include cassettes by Ballerina and Blood, Parasite Nurse, Territorial Gobbing, Afternoon Tea Time, Klein Quartet, Maltreatment, Genophobia, GX Jupiter Larson, White Widow, Dagger, KPG, Za, and Cadaver. Cruel Symphonies thanks you for your support. It is due to the generosity of customers like you that we are able to fulfill our mission of printing J cards that make print shop employees uncomfortable. One thing that has been discussed in Finnish Noise is this rural aspect, and I haven't really, you know, there's a there's a there's a recent essay out about rural noise, and there's a lot of sounds that have been described as rural. And even you know, you live in a, a larger city, but you're you're in a house which looks like it's a, a log a, a beautiful log cabin in some ways, and you know, you say you have neighbors far apart and. You guys play noise and after going in sauna and things like that. That's quite different than a lot of uh, experiences for noise artists in in other cities. 
Um, how do you think that landscape has defined the sound of Finnish noise? Yeah, yes, definitely it affects, just affects the approach to noise, how to present it. Yeah, there's uh, rural area. It definitely it's a, a set, set of mind, mind of things, the set of mind, how you approach the sound and different kind of things, I think. Uh, it's like industrial, but in a different kind of way or isolation, maybe or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Have you gone to many live gigs in Finland? Um, not many, not many, only what there has been all local act, acts mostly, but, but yeah, there's not many noise shows in Finland. And if there are days in the southern parts. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess then we will be, we will be at the point of the show where I would like to tell, uh, I'd like you to tell me your, uh, top five noise releases of all time. Um, uh, <laughs> the five, uh, definitely. The new Blockaders first album, Changes Less Bloggers, it definitely never get bored of it. Yeah. There's this, this sound. There's so much happening at the same time, and it's, it's sort of ear, ear candy. Or you can listen it. it is, that's time. really, that's really a, a special release. It's, mm -hmm. it is one of the, earliest noise recordings, but it still has a sound that almost no one has really. Yeah. I figured, try to figure it out myself. Copied or achieved. It has a very, yeah. very obscure, bizarre sound that yeah, is, yeah. you know, yeah, still extremely unique. Yeah. 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 It is. It is. Uh, that's one for sure. And, and, and the, the new boyfriends also, um, the, the initials of the new boyfriends are TNB. Yeah. It's, uh, and I, I know, I noticed that early on that when I'm, yeah. you know, when I'm typing it out or doing inventory and abbreviating yeah. TNB. So that's, yeah, that must yeah. be a clear, that's a clear reference to the new blockaders. Yeah. It's a, it's definitely a reference to it. It's a so big, uh, influence. We thought we yeah. were for, first thought it was only boyfriends, but there was so many boyfriends around that it's a new boyfriends. And then we noticed that initials are the same. So. Definitely not yeah. to that direction. One of the most influ influential albums for me too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and second, uh, when I was getting more into noise, uh, this Ashley C. Drift album released by Freak Animal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's really unique sounding tape Merc. And it's yeah. also another kind of, it's different, but you can put it on a, whenever and never yeah. get bored with. Mm -hmm. Also the other one, uh, auto tape, auto CD of Ashley C is also really good, more harsh, but that has this, this drift has this really nice atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah. I remember it. Yeah. I haven't listened to it in years, but I do remember it. Yeah. Uh, another big, one of my favorite releases, definitely super election, uh, we at Nassau. It's perfect noise album. It's everything I need from a noise. Mm -hmm. It's really good. And it, it, the chunk sounds on it are, is, are perfect. And I think it's only vinyl. I think, or what is it, some tape edition, but but it sounds really good. It's a pan yeah. release. This is the one with the the clear like vellum plastic cover, plastic, right? Yeah, yeah. And the cover yeah, is yeah. perfect too. I love it. I love yeah. the cover. It reflects the mood really well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Awesome packaging that, too. Yeah. That is, yeah, definitely one. one And and it's on Spotify too, I think. If, if not family. Yeah, it is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. I was just thinking because I, you know, I've, I've mentioned before, but like all of my, when I moved to Germany, I left all of my record collection yeah. back at my mom's basement. So yeah. I don't have so many things with me here and I've, you know, amassed a, a collection since then, but that's one 
I always am reminded of things. So oh, I'd love to listen to that, but I don't, yeah. I'll have to wait. I'll have to wait some, some years maybe, but that's good to know that it's on Spotify. So I yeah. can, I can listen to it. On Spotify, definitely. And yeah, I think micro intensive care. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It could be anything, but any, any, uh, but there's a couple of micro I really like Baroque for example, but I think it's in the intensive care. It's the most listened one and there's this really nice textures. And in some, in some ways I feel like that work is really, really not similar, but your work as opera pot seems to be very informed by this approach because it's not so cut up and it's not so cut up and spastic like this, but yeah. these, those macronympha records have this really edited tape sound where you have yeah. these live sounds like recorded in you know junk metal basements things like that but you can hear that it's all been captured to tape and then combined on tape yeah or edited in a computer but it has this kind of dense mm, condensed inside sound and yeah. that's that's yeah. what i hear in, in a lot of opera pot uh, recordings yeah, yeah. definitely i influence and uh, fifth is uh, Jakko Vanhalas, Here Be Lions. Mm. I think it mm -hmm. was 2000, almost 10 years ago. Right. I don't know. It's kind of personal. It doesn't get better than that. Yeah, uh, that's one of the most definitely listened to most albums for me. Cool. Um, what about five things of the past year? Oh, uh, so much, much stuff uh, lately. Uh, this new new very said it's really good. Yep. Yeah. I just got that. I haven't listened yet. Yeah, it's it's really good. Good CD. Uh, talk, when we talk about rural rural approach, that's definitely mm -hmm. the one. It's really good atmosphere and mood, and uh, it's finished vocals, but it definitely works mm -hmm. for NS two. And. Uh, this new Usagi CD's Flea Circus was really, mm. really nice, really nice. Cool. Really nice one. Uh, Again, I just got that too. I haven't had a chance to listen either, but I just yeah. arrived the other day. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's just cut it last week, but it's it's awesome. Awesome, definitely. Cool. And uh, last year, he sing a true tape. Brain War mm. game. Mm -hmm. uh, love that. Really nice sounding tape. It's really nice textures. Yep. Uh, was it better drumming release? Yep. In the yeah, yeah, in the in the pouch, right? Yeah. Uh, definitely that word tape you put out. Secret violence noise words. Yep. Uh, it's really good. Good one. It's coming CD. It is. It is yeah. soon. I we have we have to just finalize a few artwork things, but yeah, definitely that's an awesome release. Yeah, this new LP came out for like for free music. Uh, Incipientum. Hmm. It's a new project. I don't know. It's really unique approach, and I don't know unique, but it's really nice. I don't know. I talk about atmosphere, but maybe it's really important for me. Yeah. Yeah. It's atmosphere. Good. That's, yeah. that's something that, that's something that doesn't really get, I don't think enough attention in yeah. noise. And maybe that's something that kind of defines Finnish noise in some way. Yeah. It might be. There's a certain might atmosphere, be. but I don't know what atmosphere really means, but I use that word a lot to describe yeah. the, the feeling of a, of a of a of a piece of music or the feeling yeah. of something and mood that it's not yeah. just crunch but there is air and yeah yeah definitely there has to be in good noise i think there has to be that some personal feeling or something that defines it other than being just sound also that sound is also, also good. Yeah. When you when you make noise, are you are you trying to instill some sort of specific feeling or 
or I, I don't even want to say idea because I think idea is something different from feeling. Yeah. A lot of times things get say, okay, this is themed around baseball or this is a noise theme around, you know, this war or that, but that's different to me than, than the, the feeling or the, the, yeah. I don't know. It's, it's very obscure to, to describe. I don't know, but is that something you're consciously working on when you're, when you're doing yeah, opera not consciously, not consciously, but if I listen to something, what I record, I, it, there has to be some feeling about it. If it's, if it doesn't tell anything, then it isn't good for a release. There should be something, something, uh, to digest on like, uh, it should present, it doesn't have to present some certain thing, but it should, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Does that guide you? Does that guide you though? When, you're, when you're working on yeah, something? Guide, like... guide somewhere. Yeah. 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 Um, I think that's, that's something that I, I think is hmm. worth I think worth reminding also new artists that are that are yeah. trying to develop a sound is that I think that's the most important thing is yeah. guiding some sort of inner feeling about what you're recording yeah yeah or f following following some sort of inner feeling about what you're recording as yeah. opposed to just fo focusing on the the sonics on a technical level that you yeah. that you follow this you follow the feeling that's yeah. that's really the most important thing. Yeah, it doesn't have to. The sound, uh, sound is really important, but there's so much under it. Even low, uh, even noise is could be really low-fi music, but at the same time, yeah. it's the most high-fi music there is because right. it's all about the sound. sound yeah, but, exactly. But under it, there has to be this, this. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the worst, but yeah, it's hard to talk about because it's, it's different. It's different from an intellectual process, I think. Yeah, there are. Again, there's themes, there's ideas, there's saying, okay, yeah. I want it to sound like this. I want it to yeah. follow this kind of rule, or I want it yeah. to have this element and that element, and it's very calculated. But I think that doesn't really work. I think you, that only works for a point. But I think if you're not listening to yourself and you're mm -hmm. not listening to your inner drives, your inner resonance yeah i guess that sounds like kind of obscure new age whatever but yeah. you have to be listening to that inner resonance and that's yeah. what will guide i think yeah. make a great release you know yeah yeah great great yeah. great music yeah that's for sure what have you got planned for the next coming year a couple of releases i i had to uh, for, for this year it's opera but maybe one or two releases at least. Mm -hmm. uh, one is almost finished. I think I have to listen it and, mm -hmm. and uh, digest it a bit. And maybe and now it's set up what I have taken lots of time. And there's new tapes coming in a few weeks, I think, and a couple of CDs too. Approaching on, to on your label. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's crazy how how much you've been putting out all of a sudden. I mean, I can't yeah. imagine a, a seven a seven tape batch and the art the artwork the packaging. I have them; they're out of reach. They're over there on the shelf. I would show some the artwork yeah. and packaging. Oh, here's like for example one. Um, you know, it's uh, there's very unique packaging on all of these releases. Some are standard uh, Norelco tapes, but some yeah. have special boxes with special printing. Um, I know for, from my experience that how, I mean, it takes me a long time to put that stuff together. Um, yeah, yeah it takes definitely and dubbing the tapes and all, but uh, the seven tape batches, they just piled up. So it was good to release them at the same time, time. And, yeah. and I like the packages to be different it, from it. Yeah. It's, uh, it's definitely represent more of the artists output of things things i like right. labels that have aesthetics but it would be really 
I would get bored if the, everything looks the same. And I like to figure right. out the packages myself. So yep. to, although might be, uh, I like to keep it compact to it uh, yep. easier, easy to ship and, and to put on the shelves that there's not Definitely. everywhere, but, but yeah, definitely. That's one interesting, interesting aspect of doing releases is making a different, different kind of things. Yeah. And the upper part releases that are coming up, do they have, do they have labels that are, do they, are they already fixed for labels? Uh, yeah. Cool. Do you want to yeah. tell us? Uh, I haven't decided yet. <laughs> okay. Good. A right. couple of submissions. Yeah. A couple of. Okay. In the Good. Do you see yourself if the pandemic uh, finally opens things up, um, doing some live gigs in the next year? Do you think maybe, new boyfriends would play live? Uh, yeah, maybe the new boyfriends. This would be easier to do live live stuff. Maybe that mm -hmm. have to figure out how to, how to mic that thing, thing up. But maybe for you know, the new boyfriends it would be good to try that live concert thing. Maybe for upper part, but we'll see. Yeah. See that. That's an interesting thing. I mean, that's not, I don't mean to try to give you tips about live noise or something like that, but it's an interesting thing about playing with junk metal live is that that can also be very difficult. Yeah. Because, yeah, yeah. you know, you have in the studio setting, you have the ability to yeah. just mic it how and capture what you want to capture. Um, but, in a live setting, you also usually have this sound of the yeah. actual acoustic yeah. resonance of the of the metal, and that sometimes can sound really bad, or or, or, yeah. or it can sound at least not bad, but it's it often sounds not as powerful yeah. at all yeah. as what you're what you're channeling through the, the the electronic signal. So, a lot of times playing scrap metal in a live mm. setting, you're smashing something, and you want to have this massive sound like you have when you record maybe you do but you also then have on top this layer of like you know yeah. this this ch -ch -ch -ch, really? which can if you're not playing on a lot uh, a big enough system yeah that's definitely the challenge we are to have talked about it, how would we do it because it's the sound is really important thing and it's yeah it's mostly air mic it's my mic from the air and yeah. Not, oh, yeah. Maybe one contact mic on on a on the pedal chain, but nothing yeah. like that. That it's I don't know how it works in live situation, but I, I had to figure it out. I just remembered something that I thought of before, and maybe this is this will give you some ideas or something like that. But I thought I was thinking about that issue one time, and I thought maybe someone could do a set, perform live, um, using junk metal where they're in a different room yeah than the than the audience yeah yeah in order to in order to separate that sound a bit you know maybe a, a, a the performer maybe both performers or one performer doing the metal junks is in a completely separate room yeah with the that door closed right. and have their mics mm. set up how they want to capture the sound separate from the from the PA, so you know the feedback isn't there, and also the the acoustic sound of the metal isn't in the room, yeah. and then that would be maybe mixed by another person. And I, I I thought of it like maybe there could be a, I mean, in a in a very very perfect situation there could be like a soundproof room like with glass or something like that. Yeah, that would be really nice. Or there could also be you know a video feed or something like that, like yeah. a like a camera projecting the image into the room. Yeah. I don't know. Just I, I, I was just reminded of that, that idea I had, but I think I think that 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 could be maybe a, some sort of solution. There could be solutions outside of the the typical setup of you know two guys yeah. in a room in front of the PA. You know, yeah, yeah definitely that would work. That should sound. Which could have some interesting visual visual elements to it. Of course, it would make the playing different and the whole yeah. experience different. But it could be it yeah. could be interesting. Also, I, I thought uh, doing a all, all acoustic live sets with with metal if, if yeah. you need just really big uh, room or hall or some with good yeah. echo and if you do it on the corner or somewhere or people are gathered around maybe it's, it might sound good or only with acoustic yeah. because it's 
really pretty loud sound without amplifying too. Or, you know, yeah, the, exactly. And then you can really focus the on the acoustics of the metal itself. Yeah. 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 It's possibilities. There are many. An old barn. You need an old barn or a grain silo. Yeah, um, yeah. Those in rural there. Finland. Yeah, lots of abundant silos, barns for concerts, maybe. Cool. Well, I hope that comes to be, and I hope um, I hope to know about it when it happens. Now available from White Centipede Noise, Altar of Flies, Otterblick Triple LP. There has always been chafing and harsh elements in Altar of Flies, but never before has he put that particular ingredient in focus like this. Electronics burnt to crisp, crackling meat slab fizz, and reckless physical wreckage. All this paired with his signature vintage apparatus and magnetic tape wizardry. And the result is an elegantly churned up pigsty. That is an excerpt from the extensive liner notes written by Eric Neustrand. Available at whitesemminoise.com, Bandcamp, and soon, a distro near you. I really appreciate you talking with me. Um, and, uh, you know, everyone keep an eye out. You're, you're super active right now. I hope, I hope you can maintain your energy. Don't, don't, uh, don't burn yourself out because I think you're onto something really good. And I think, uh, we want you for the long, the long run. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I try to keep <laughs> steady, steady pace. Well, thank you. See you later. You. See you later, Vijo. See you. Thanks. Thanks again for tuning into White Sampy Noise Podcast. Head over to the Patreon for more, including private episodes of Noise on the Run, exclusive photos, video, and audio related to the show, and discounts at the White Sampy Noise mail order. Your support is extremely appreciated and vital to keep the show going.